Thanks very much. Um, thanks to Linda for putting together this really phenomenal meeting. I'm really enjoying myself. And thanks to the last speaker for setting some of my data up. I didn't know how integrated this would be, but it's, uh, I'll get to the question of the mTOR pathway in the middle of the talk. Um, I've been asked to talk about IGF-1 and growth hormone action, muscle and bone, and what I want to do is share with you some of the data we put together over the last number of years, which really tried to dissect these two pathways using genetically altered mouse models. And by showing you these examples, I think it'll stimulate discussion, and, and I think the, they're revealing in certain ways with respect to what a growth hormone and IGF-1 do independently. This is a collaboration between Doug G. Girolamo at Johns Hopkins and Karen Esser at the University of Kentucky, and it's supported by a grant from NIAMS. And that's the only disclosures I have. I was going to show um, a slide to justify the importance of the growth hormone IGF-1 axis, but I think we'll stipulate, if the audience will permit me, that it's important in building both muscle and bone. What isn't known is, again, what I alluded to, and that is how these growth factors, these anabolic growth factors, how do they work together or, or can they work independently through their own receptors? And that's exactly what we set out to do. And that's not a trivial um, distinction because uh, growth hormone continues to be used uh, in aging clinics and in off-label use to enhance performance. So I think it also could have, if one could figure out the signaling pathways, there are clear differences in the way these two pathways act, and that's what I'll try to get at today. Now, the main uh, problem, of course, is the interconnectedness. So you have growth hormone made in the anterior, anterior pituitary acting in target tissues, the liver, and elsewhere through its receptor, a JAK-STAT receptor, receptor, which can activate both ERK, PI3 kinase, and STATs, uh, in particular STAT5, which is the STAT that activates IGF-1. So IGF-1 is made in the liver and many other tissues in response to growth hormone. That ends up in the circulation or in these local uh, sites. It activates its own tyrosine kinase receptor, uh, which activates a common set of, a relatively common set of signal transduction pathways and produces very common effects in many tissues. So the problem is separating these two interconnected pathways. And that's why we've used genetically, uh, genetically altered mouse models using Crelox recombination to test both in vitro and in vivo the effects of these two growth, arm, growth factors. The two um, models that have been historically used to explain this interconnectedness are listed, are, are shown, uh, illustrated on this slide. The, the, the oldest one is called the somatomedin hypothesis, referring to IGF-1 being a somatomedin, and that suggests that growth hormone uh, increases IGF-1 production from the liver and from local tissues, and um, if and, and then it, the IGF-1 actually is the main somatomedin accounting for most of the effects of growth hormone arri arriving either from the circulation or, the, or locally. Uh, there is a second model uh, called the dual effector hypothesis propo uh, proposed by Green in a number of tissues, chondrocytes and, and fat, and that uh, suggests that growth hormone might have independent effects uh, to increase the differentiation of initial progenitor cells and IGF-1, again, arriving from liver or local sites, could an expand that initially differentiated cell. Uh, and so we use these two models as rough paradigms for what we tried to do uh, using the, the genetic techniques. So let's first deal with the bone effects or the skeletal effects of the two uh, pathways to uh, delete the growth hormone receptor gene in uh, chondrocytes, we crossed mice carrying flox deletes for the growth hormone receptor with mice expressing the Cree recombinase off a of collagen 2 promoter. And we determined that these, uh, the deletion by using laser capture microdissection, uh, you can see the, uh, we, we removed most of the growth hormone receptor, but left intact here the IGF-1 receptor, which is important for the conclusions of the study. So this just shows the remnants of the growth plates, which we laser dissected out. Surprisingly, the growth plates of the mice lacking growth hormone receptor were entirely normal. Mice grew normally, had absolutely no long bone phenotype, growth plate phenotype that we could detect at all. And other studies, which I don't have time to show you, suggest strongly that this is due to upregulation of local IGF-1. In addition, I remind you that IGF is available in the circulation. This probably rescued this phenotype. 
this contrasts markedly to what's seen if you delete the IGF-1 receptor using exactly the same genetic techniques. And I show you data from Dan Bickley and Wenhan Chang, who are actually in the audience. Uh, on the top shows that the deletion uh, using the collagen 2 promoter in a constitutive form ends up with mice even showing a growth retardation before birth and then after birth. And many of these animals don't live. But if you use a tamoxif, an inducible collagen 2, you can show that the phenotype in chondrocytes in the growth plate that lack the IGF-1 receptor, uh, there's, a, there's a decrease in the proliferative capacity in the proliferative zone of the chondrocytes, ending up with a shorter hypertrophic zone. And data, again, I won't have time to show you from their group, suggests that there's an interaction with the IGF-1 receptor signaling pathway with PTH Indian hedgehog signaling. So suffice it to say, though, that IGF-1 receptor signaling is critical for growth plate elongation, whereas surprisingly, a growth hormone receptor is not and is dispensable. So in terms of uh, oh, so, so in terms of growth plate, it's the somatomedin hypothesis that really dominates here. So what about in bone and osteoblasts? And these are uh, I'll just show you a few examples of work that Doug DiGirolamo did. Um, basically, uh, we had made a uh, osteoblast specific uh, knockout of the IGF-1 receptor, a mouse that we made, and that. Uh, model was used by Doug to test the effects whether growth hormone could actually rescue any of these effects of, that we see we saw in this mouth. One of the effects was sh is shown over here, um, and that is that if you if you delete the IGF-1 receptor from osteoblasts, you end up at three weeks with a decrease in osteoblast number that's shown here, about a 50% reduction. So what Doug did was then come along with growth hormone and give fairly large doses of growth hormone to this animal that couldn't respond through the IGF-1 receptor. And he saw a marked increase in the control animals uh, of growth hormone increasing osteoblast number, but absolutely no effect on osteoblast number in the, in the mouse that lacked the IGF-1 receptor. Again, suggesting that the ability of growth hormone to stimulate osteoblast uh, proliferation, or the lack thereof in this case, was due to growth hormone stimulating at least IGF-1 signaling. Let me just go back up a little bit if I can. So again, uh, I won't have time to show you all the data, but he made, he characterized the growth hormone receptor knockouts, and suffice it to say that they never really had any distinguishable phenotype different from the IGF-1 receptor knockouts, any site that we could see. So in terms of growth hormone action in bone, the somatomedin hypothesis holds. In our case, in our, we haven't looked at everything. I can't rule out other effects, but in, in the growth plate and in osteoblasts, the ability of growth hormone to stimulate anabolic effects is due to IGF-1 signaling, we believe. Now I'm going to move the same experimental paradigm to muscle and, and, and spend most of the time do, talking about the same type of approach in muscle. And I thank the previous speaker for introducing uh, some of these concepts. Uh, we, we began our work with in vitro studies looking at uh, the ability of both IGF-1 and growth hormone to stimulate in vitro cell proliferation of myoblasts isolated from mouse muscle, and then the fusion steps, which, he, which we'll, we'll get into. So when cells are placed in culture, there's a, if you withdraw serum, proliferating myoblasts fuse, and in two stages, uh, 24 hours, they're basically, they're, you can show two stages of this. There's an early accumulation of myonuclei, and then a second further accumulation of mature myotubes form from that point on. Uh, these myoblasts uh, obtain, uh, you know, are phenotypically real muscle myoblasts, and here's some genes that are expressed that. They express all the components we're interested in, including the ability of, in this case, growth hormone to stimulate IGF-1 uh, mRNA shown here over this time course. Now, so essentially, growth factors can stimulate the, the uh, syncytium, can accumulate muscle uh, in, in its final uh, mature myotubes by either increasing the proliferative capacity of early myoblasts or increasing the uh, fusion steps uh, so that more nuclei accumulate. And we tested these two pathways in the in vitro system. Uh, the first was just to just look at the ability of these two growth factors stimulate proliferation, and we did this very acutely to make sure we weren't seeing changes in IGF-1. So in these cases, we're looking at BRDU incorporation at six hours in myoblasts, and growth hormone had absolutely no effect, whereas IGF-1 stimulated BRDU incorporation. I just remind you that this is before one would see an accumulation of protein. This is mRNA here. So before you would ever see uh, accumulation of uh, IGF-1 protein, uh, growth hormone couldn't affect proliferative capacity of these myoblasts. In the same way, then, we looked at fusion events, and our, we could separate these two uh, into two separate phases. If 
Growth factors, including IGF-1 and, and, uh, and IGF-1, were added for the entire 48-hour period after withdrawing serum. Uh, you get these preliminary fusion step and then an accumulation of myonuclei. Growth hormone added through the entire 48-hour period stimulated accumulation or, uh, of myonuclei measured by the fusion index, which you saw previously from the previous uh, speaker. However, if you added it during the first 24 hours and then withdrew the hormone, uh, and then measured uh, fusion index at 48 hours, there was no, basically no effect of growth hormone. However, if you added it during the second, left it alone the first 24 hours and added it after withdrawing serum at the, after the second 48 hours, then growth hormone could actually stimulate fusion, suggesting that growth hormone worked during the second phase of fusion. Then the question was, which receptor? Was it, was it through growth hormone receptor or through IGF-1 receptor? And that could be tested because we had both myoblasts knocked out with the IGF-1 receptor and growth hormone receptor. Here's the control fusion index. If you add growth hormone to cells that lack its receptor, of course, you don't get anything. There's no receptor. IGF-1 can still activate fusion or increase myonuclei accumulation. If you take cells now that myoblasts that lack the IGF-1 receptor, there is no effect on fusion, again suggesting that growth hormone stimulates uh, fusion in this case and expansion of the, my of the differentiated myotube through an IGF-1-dependent pathway. We know that this, uh, this effect of uh, growth hormone IGF-1 actually involves NFATC2 and IL-4 accumulation, but seeing the previous speaker's talk, I, it gave me a lot of interesting ideas about further uh, dissecting that pathway. So the conclusion from these uh, in vitro experiments is that IGF-1 stimulates myoblast proliferation, whereas growth hormone promotes through an IGF-1-dependent pathway the fusion and differentiation, the mature myotube. Uh, and both of these uh, pathways probably intersect, at least in part, the NFATC2 pathway. So now we, we turned our attention to in vivo models. And again, using Crelox recombination techniques, we made a mouse. Uh, analyzed two mice, one that lacked the growth hormone receptor, I'll show you that first, and then compared that to one that lacked the IGF-1 receptor. In, in mice expressing the Cree recombinase off the MEF2 Cree uh, mouse that was made by Brian Black, and this is really a, a nice mouse because it really expresses uh, Cree only in uh, muscle and skeletal muscle and not in the heart as so many of the other earlier um, muscle-specific promoters did. Uh, importantly, again, if you measure growth hormone receptor ablation down here, you see that that's at 6 and 16 weeks, it's gone, whereas IGF-1 receptor, importantly for our studies, was remained intact. So this promoter very, worked very well for us. Histomorphometrically, mice that lacked the growth hormone receptor had, uh, this, is a, this is basically histomorphometry staining with myosin heavy chain uh, showing type 1 fiber specific, uh, it's type 1 fibers, and essentially the, the fibers uh, had less myonuclei and there were less type 1 fibers uh, in the mice that lacked the growth hormone receptor. And there was also a decrease in the diameter of individual fibers. These are six-week-old animals, and the, the phenotype really remained out through 16 to 28 weeks. So bas basically, the decrease in my nuclei and the narrowing would be consistent with our in vitro results, suggesting, again, that growth hormone through, probably through IGF-1 receptor, at least from the in vitro studies, had effects on fusion and accumulation of myonuclei. Functionally, this would be expected to produce mice that are weaker, and we tested this in very crude assays up to now, just grip strength uh, in, a, in an apparatus like this. Uh, the growth hormone receptor knockout mice uh, had decreased uh, uh, for, or, uh, muscle strength, as shown by this, and then a rotor rod test, which is really a combination of balance, muscle contraction, and probably neuromuscular reactivity. Uh, also, they fell off these rotor rods at a greater rate than the, the mice that uh, the control mice. Again, suggesting that functional impairment of this uh, uh, the, the muscle that lacked the growth hormone receptor. Now, a surprise came uh, when, we, when we started to analyze uh, older mice that, that the growth hormone receptor knockout in muscle, and that is, they became fat. Uh, here's a, a, a mouse that lacks the growth hormone receptor. At about 10 to 12 weeks, they separated from the controls. And, and this really had, uh, had all, everything to do with increased peripheral fat and really didn't change, as far as we could tell, lean mass. I might tell you that these animals had no change in bone density whatsoever, despite changes in fat mass. Um, they uh, basically, we immediately checked whether they were the food intake and, and energy expenditure was different, and they weren't. The animals ate about the same, had no differences in energy expenditure for, compared to controls, and this was done over a four-day period using me metabolic cages. Uh, 
They did, however, uh, have high serum glucoses and basically high triglycerides, suggesting the, uh, the uh, onset of insulin resistance. And this was actually confirmed using glucose tolerance tests and insulin tolerance tests. So these animals became severely resistant to the action of insulin, getting to the question that was raised earlier. Cells from these animals and culture also were resistant to insulin. This is just glucose uptake by 2-deoxyglucose in response to insulin. The control cells had a robust increase in uptake. Uh, it basically, if, it, it, I'm sorry, this is just showing that insulin, uh, in these insulin stimulated glucose uptake in the control was, 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 uh, was markedly increased. And if you, if you basically had myoblasts that lacked the growth hormone receptor, this was severely blunted uh, in the cells that lacked the receptor. So Doug set out with a bunch of antibodies and a, and a textbook and said, where in the world is this insulin receptor pathway defect, defective or desensitized? And he basically found that every single step was downregulated from the top. So that you basically the IR by immun immunoblotting was down. But this is the important probably thing, and it brings the, the, the point that somebody raised from the audience. There's a serine on IRS-1 that's, uh, there's a number of serines that are phosphorylated, and it, when they're phosphorylated, they, uh, again, through mTOR signaling and S6 kinase, they, they phosphorylate uh, IRS-1 and cause insulin receptors de uh, receptor to be desensitized. And that clearly, the serine 1101 was markedly increased in phosphorylation, and that led to decreased in downstream signaling events. So essentially, loss of growth hormone receptor resulted in this mouse that was decreased in terms of insulin sensitivity. So that was different. The question is what happens now when we contrast that to mice that lack the IGF-1 receptor using the identical technique. So again, Crelox technique using the same Cre. Uh, again, this is just showing the confirmation that we decreased the, uh, deleted the IGF-1 receptor, had no effect on growth hormone receptor. And this just shows over here, IGF-1, to some extent, later on seems to go up, and perhaps this is some attempt at the cells to compensate. Uh, at any rate, they couldn't fully con compensate for some of the phenotypes I'll show you. Now, the important thing to dismiss, first of all, and I think the really interesting thing for discussion is that these mice never became fat. So again, this is now where the f with our first evidence for the, for the separation of these two pathways. These mice, you know, in fact, if anything, they, they basically lost a little of their body weight uh, over periods of time, but not, not remarkably so, and certainly never became insulin resistant or had any evidence of metabolic abnormalities. Um, they did, however, have an absolutely identical histological phenotype in terms of uh, decreased myonuclei over here, uh, at, these are these are, I think are at 16 weeks, uh, decreased uh, type one in, in type one fibers, uh, a decrease um, over here in myofiber cross sectional area, and I'll just show you again this this is almost phenocopying exactly what we saw in terms of the histological decreases in the growth hormone receptor knockout using that same te Crelox technique. So with respect to histology, these two. Uh, mouse models looked virtually identical, but they differed with respect to the metabolic effects. Now, we've had a chance uh, in collaboration with Ken Campbell and, and Karen Esser at the University of Kentucky to start looking in a more detailed way at the functional aspects of some of these myofibers. And Ken Campbell has developed a technique where he can isolate individual myofibers from mice, culture them in a bath where he can change the calcium content, look at ex excitation contraction coupling. And we, we gave him, he actually obtained some of our um, myofibers from the IGF-1 receptor knockout mice. And we're doing now a series of studies comparing both receptor knockouts. But it was interesting in his in preliminary experiments using this technique, the uh, force generated in the, in the IGF-1 receptor knockout myofibers was less uh, than the controls, indicating that there's a functional abnormality level of excitation contraction coupling. Now, I should say that we don't know that could be a developmental phenotype. It says nothing about acute loss of the IGF-1 receptor or growth hormone receptor, and those experiments are now underway, again, with Karen, who's developed a tamoxifen-inducible uh, Cree, which we can come along and acutely disrupt these two receptors and look at this functional uh, change, which we think is quite interesting, which, again, would support the idea there's some evidence, strong evidence in smooth muscle that the IGF-1 pathway, pathway can impact contract contractile apparatus and calcium uh, contractility. 
So with respect to muscle, there's a little bit of a difference in that the growth hormone IGF-1 seem to be able to do, uh, function separately through their own receptors. Certainly, um, we, we think that the, um, both, both of these th growth hormone acting through STAT5 with the release of IGF-1, uh, we think that that really has, uh, is the main way that it, the, the uh, differentiation pathway is controlled by growth hormone. It's through the IGF-1 receptor, and that'll, that is important for keeping uh, uh, the, for the muscle fiber to develop and fuse normally. However, growth hormone through its receptor, not involving the IGF-1 pathway, clearly has an important role in metabolism. And, and insulin responsivity, because if you lack that growth hormone receptor, those muscles become severely insulin resistant. That's not what you see when you give growth hormone to somebody. So it's a little bit of an arbitrary model, but I think it tells us something very interesting about how these two anabolic factors can work together or separately in these two different tissues. Okay, that's, that's basically it. I'll leave the questions for later, but uh, thanks very much. That was really nice. So I've got a couple of questions with your growth hormone receptor knockout. I mean, you, you have um, adiposity in these animals, but you didn't have any change in food intake or energy expenditure. So how do you explain that? Well, I mean, there is an insulin resistance. Then you know, it's, it, in, if you if you block nutrient uptake in the muscle, nutrients have to go somewhere else. Now we didn't have, you know, we didn't measure any energy. And you're right. I don't. I can't explain it for now. But that presumably that nutrient excess would have to be deposited somewhere. I don't like to think of passive mechanisms, but you're right. We didn't see any food intake, behavioral changes, or. That's correct. So, so one one thing we we see this sometimes as well. And and you set and, me up. No, 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 I just think that what you, what you probably need to do is uh, maybe look at, um, uh, take um, fecal samples and do bomb calorimetry experiments because in some of these models you can get malabsorption and that's where the energy may go. Um, the other question I had is, um, in, in, in the muscle, did you look at steatosis mm -hmm. in the muscle because the, the, impaired insulin action may be due to um, diacylglycerol or ceramide accumulation which is known to inhibit insulin sensitivity and given that your animals are already obese that's likely. Did you look at we that? We did and they have it. Ah, oh, okay, fine, thanks. I'm back to San Francisco. Tom, your answer there actually sets up a question that I have for you that you alluded to just at the end of your talk. And namely that when we give, I mean, uh, kids who have, let's say, growth hormone issues, deficiencies are fat. But when we give a lot of growth hormone, we have major problems with insulin intolerance. Uh, I mean, they get, they get hyperglycemic. IGF, on the other hand, as you well know, when you give that, in fact, you run the risk of hypoglycemia. So we have these two very clearly big differences. Now the question is when you knock out the growth hormone receptor, your growth hormone levels are going to be quite high, uh, I would expect. I presume you've measured that and you, you've seen that. So the question is, is when we give growth hormone to treat kids, um, are we, uh, and are you in your mouse model affecting places like the liver uh, where you are in fact maybe contributing in part to or the fat, the adipocytes, creating the insulin resistance in those tissues and less so in the muscle? Or do you really think that what you're doing is altering muscle sensitivity to insulin, which I'm less confident of, even though you showed very nicely the IRS uh, one serine phosphorylation? No. So what, what do you think? Well, I think it's mainly muscle. You know, we've looked at other tissues and we can't really see insulin resistance peripherally in other tissues that you might expect. And I can't, I really have no explanation. There are ways to, I mean, I'm not, I don't think, I haven't thought long enough. There are people that have spent their lives, you one, or one of them, in terms of studying growth from an action. It's a very different situation when you're knocking something out, a receptor, for example, in a tissue and you really don't have all the controls as opposed to giving a, a hormone that can act on all these different tissues, including the liver, to make more mm -hmm. IGF-1. So I don't have a good answer for you, but I can tell you that the, the muscle becomes severely insulin resistant. We believe that the, that's a major uh, deep, uh, phenotype that, that's, that's, that's probably accounting for the main accumulation of fat in muscle, 
and probably in the periphery because I think that nutrients are really not being used in the same way in that tissue. Well, why doesn't the IGF-1 receptor do I, this? Because it, it's working it, through the mTOR pathway. Yeah, I don't know. Don't know. So there's something, I mean, yeah, right. obviously but very it, different. And here. that's why it's exciting. Because yeah. we have the opportunity, I think, to really see new pathways which really hadn't been appreciated before, and which you'd never find, incidentally, if you'd try to do these experiments by giving growth hormone or taking it away. Yeah, it's fascinating. Tom, can you refresh my memory on whether lorone type dwarves have the same type of uh, adiposity and insulin resistance that you've described I in your I asked Steve Chernosek that, and he said there, are, there is evidence for you know, people with growth hormone deficiency and receptors and so forth being small, but ha actually having peripheral fat. But I don't want to make too much out of that, because again, there are other ways to explain you know, or not explain that, that type of thing. But I was looking for the same, uh, you know, kind mm -hmm. of correlation in humans, and I asked Steve Chernosek, who studies those people, and yeah. he says there is evidence for that. Well, okay. 